Good morning. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Easter morning. Praise the Lord. Hey, good morning, everyone. My name is Clint Kunze. It is uh, good to be gathered up with you guys this morning. And um, what a joy. I want to read you guys a couple of verses from the very first Easter morning from Matthew uh, chapter 28. And uh, it's when the, the Marys, they head down to the tomb and, and uh, they, they go down there looking for Jesus and, and they don't find him. And they, uh, instead, they find an angel. And uh, this is kind of where we pick up in uh, 28 verse 5. It says this, Then the angel spoke to the women. Don't be afraid, he said. I know you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He isn't here. He has risen from the dead, just as he said would happen. Come, see where his body was laying. And, and now go quickly and tell. Now go quickly and tell. And, and I tell you, I love this, this uh, being a part of this church, a part of uh, a body of believers that get to, uh, to go and tell uh, the world, tell the valley, uh, tell our community, tell the world that Jesus is risen. The best news you're going to hear all week long. A couple of announcements besides Jesus is alive. Um, a couple of, uh, of announcements. Uh, first of all, our online connection card um, at rlmsv.com. You can go there. Please go there and let us know that uh, you joined up this morning to uh, join us as we worship on this Easter morning. Um, also, any prayer requests, um, you need to know that we are praying for you. And um, any prayer requests that you might have, big or small, um, the, the email is prayers at rlmsilvervalley.com. And also I'll mention, um, if you need any help, if you need a hand with anything, um, any help that you might need at all, um, there's a, an email for that, and that is uh, helpline, helpline at rlmsilvervalley.com. So um, don't hesitate to uh, reach out. We really do want to help you. Um, also, um, certainly ministry is happening uh, a bunch. Jesus is on the move, and, and it's fun uh, being a part of a church that that is, that is moving and, and up to stuff throughout uh, this time, this kind of crazy time. Um, and so different ways to give. I'll just mention um, uh, online, you can give at, at uh, rlmsv.com uh, slash give. Again, that's rlmsv.com slash give. Um, or you can text giving at uh, 208 268-6825. So I uh, just wanted to mention those things. Um, again, we're praying for you guys during this time, and we are excited to join back together after we kind of come out on the other end of this, and uh, we're excited to, to gather up and, and um, uh, join together as a family again. Um, I think with that, let's, uh, let's say a prayer. Lord God, we thank you for the cross. We thank you for uh, going to the cross on our behalf. Lord, for for uh, for for paying for paying our debt, Lord, thank you that three days later you rose from the dead. Lord, thank you for that game changer. Lord, thank you for uh, you uh, being a God that keeps His word. Lord, thank you for the, uh, your your life. Lord, thank you for the the new life, the resurrected life that we get to to participate in and be a part of as well. Uh, God, you are good. Jesus, thank you for going ahead of us. And uh, Lord, thank you for the invitation to go and tell, to, to join you in what you're up to in, uh, in our world, in our community. Uh, Lord, thank you. We love you, and it's in your risen name that we pray. Amen. Two, three, four.
Well, thank you, worship team, for leading us this morning. Good morning, church. I am so, so glad to see you. Um, and thanks for choosing to worship Jesus with us this Resurrection Sunday morning. Um, so there's this thing that the church does throughout history on, uh, on Resurrection Sunday morning. Is the pastor will call out to the congregation. He is risen. And then the custom is for the congregation to call back to the pastor. He is risen indeed. So we're going to try that this morning and see how that works um, across the electrons into the vi virtual world. So you ready? Here we go. He is risen. All right. By faith, I'm believing that you joined me this morning. Um, we're going to give you a couple housekeeping items this morning. Uh, Friday night, as we celebrated Good Friday, I told you that um, this is going to be the spring and summer of parties. So we are going to have a party when we get back together as a faith family and get to worship Jesus together. And then we're going to continue and have another party this summer as we um, get an opportunity to have our grand opening service down at the new facility that God's providing for us. Um, so do me a favor, if you would, as we prep for that facility, continue to pray for uh, the workers' progress, for their safety, for their health, but also continue to ask God um, who to invite to come be a part of our faith family this year as we continue to work, uh, reach the world for Jesus one person at a time. So one of the things that we started doing um, during this uh, social distancing time is I uh, do my best to say hello to all the kids in our family um, uh, while, we're, while we're doing this online uh, for a couple reasons. First of all, I want them to know that, uh, that this is their church and we miss them and we want them to know that uh, they matter here. And then the other thing is I just miss them a whole bunch. So, uh, so I'm going to uh, say hi to them this morning and then we'll continue with our worship. So I'm going to start with Caleb and Madison and Elijah. Hi, you guys, and Dawson and Savannah and Matthew. Hi, Matthew Ferguson and Aniston and Reese and Robbie and Emery, Emmett and Emery Joe and Emrick and Jane and Bo and Ben and Adeline and Annika and Christian and Riot and Ridley and Finley and Ruby and Scout and Riot and, uh, uh, Riot, yeah, Riot and Ridley and Finley, Ruby, Scout and Raya and Logan and Addison and Ella and Lyle and Walker and Avery and Bethany and Molly and Max and Bailey, and Reese, and Malachi, and Nikki, and Elijah, and Lane, and Adelie, and Isla Joy, and Liam, and Scarlett, and Andy, and Emma, and Elijah, and T-Rex, and Connor, and Carter, and Jeremiah, and Ezra, and Zoe, and Xander, and Chance, and Ethan, and Grant, and Brooke, and Lauren, and Eric, and Clara, and Ava, and Mason, and Cameron, uh, hi, Paige, and Toby, and Penelope, and Zeke, and Luke, and Lila, and Adeline, and Kyler, Kyler, and Ivy, and Malia, and Florence, and Fiona, and Florabella, and Aaron, and Isaac, and Ella, and Cade, and Thorson, and Ben, and Emma, and Maggie, and Madeline, Madeline and Harley, and Gemma. Man, I miss you guys so much, and I can't wait uh, to see you. And you can have all the donuts you want when you get back, okay? Um, unless mom and dad says no. Um, but that's okay. Tell them Pastor Gene said it's okay. Um, the other thing that I'd like to do this morning is say hello to those from our church family who are serving in the armed forces, who are away from home. So, Jared, uh, hello, and, and thanks so much for your service this morning. And Hannah, I hope you're doing well, and... I uh, uh, can't wait to see you again. And Megan, uh, God bless you. And thank you so much for uh, being willing to be away from home. So uh, I told you a Friday night as we, uh, as we uh, uh, looked at the story of Good Friday that the story is good. And I get to tell you the rest of the story this morning. So we're calling this sermon, The Story is Good, <laughs> Resurrection Sunday. So we're going to pray, and then uh, I'm going to tell you the story of the resurrection and why it matters to us this morning. So please join me as we pray. Father God, we love you. Thanks so much, God, for sending your son Jesus to rescue us. Thanks for displaying your power and conquering sin and death. And thank you, God, for being faithful and good in our lives. Thank you for calling us out of darkness into light. And thank you, Lord, for being so good to us. We pray this, Jesus, in your holy name. Amen. You know, as, as I grew up in and out of the church, uh, it's interesting that 
um, I was really familiar with the cross, and it seems like we talked about the cross all the time. But you know, at Easter, the cross is important. But man, it's the empty tomb that makes Resurrection Sunday so special. The empty tomb is what all of Christianity um, bases its foundation and its faith on. So here's what we're going to do. I'm going to start in John chapter 20 this morning. I'm going to read through the story of uh, that first Resurrection Sunday. And then, um, and then we're just going to, we got a lot of ground to cover this morning. So hang on. It, it's it's going to be a super fun ride. So in John chapter 20, verse 1, it starts out, Early on the day of the uh, first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So this is after three days after Jesus um, died on the cross. He was put in the tomb. Uh, she goes to prepare his body for burial, and the stone's been removed. Verse 2, so she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved. So this is so cool, right? This book is written by John, who's the other disciple, and John says about himself, I'm the one Jesus loved. Watch this. And said, this is what Mary says to them, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb and we don't know where they have put him. So Peter and the other disciple started for their tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over and looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but he did not go in. So think about this for a second, because this is awesome. John stops at the, at the entrance to the tomb, and it looks like he's bent over looking in. Now look what happens next. Then Simon Peter came along behind him and went straight into the tomb. So it looks like... Simon Peter has given John a little bit of a hockey check on his way into the tomb, right? Right? It's pretty awesome when you read it. Um, and it says, he saw strips of linen lying there, as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head. The cloth was still lying in its place, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple, who reached the tomb first, also went inside. He saw and believed. They still did not understand from Scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to where they were staying. Now Mary stood outside the tomb crying. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white seated there, or seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. They asked her, Woman, why are you crying? They have taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they have put him. At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there. But she did not realize it was Jesus. He asked her, Woman, why are you crying? Who is it, that, uh, who is it you are looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him, and I will get him. And Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned toward him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher, rabbi. Jesus said, do not hold on to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news, and look what she says, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. I have seen the Lord, right? It's through Jesus' resurrection that, that both John and Mary believed that Jesus Christ is who, he's, is, is who he says he is, that he is both Savior and Lord, that he is God who came to earth to, to forgive our sins. Now, it, it, later on, um, the Apostle Paul, or yeah, Paul, when he writes about this moment in history, he says this in 1 Corinthians 15, he says, now, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel that I preached to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel, you are saved if you hold firmly to the word I preached to you. Otherwise, you have believed in vain. So otherwise, if, if, if you don't hold firmly to this, otherwise, you believe something that's not true, he says. 
For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance. He's like, this is the most important thing I can tell you. That Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. That he was buried and that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. And that he appeared to Cephas, who's Peter, and then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time. Most of whom are still living though some have fallen asleep, or some translations, although some of them have died. A little bit later, in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 12, Peter writes this, But if it's preached that Christ has been raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection from the dead? If there's no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaches, preaching is useless and so is your faith. More than that, we are then found to be false witnesses about God. For we have testified about God that he raised Christ from the dead. But if he did not raise him, if in fact the dead are not raised, and if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you're still in your sins. Then those also have fallen asleep in Christ are lost. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are of all people most to be pitied. But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep, right? the, 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 the first of the resurrection of those who have died. Verse 21, For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead also comes through a man. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ, all will be made alive. So here's what Paul's talking about, right? There's two groups of people. There are those that are standing firm in the word of their salvation and those that Paul warns might have believed in vain or those who are believing something that wasn't true. Now, here's the reality, okay? Um, if I was trying to make everyone like me this morning, I would tend to, uh, to be super inclusive and say things like, it doesn't really matter what you believe, just believe whatever you want. There's a lot of different ways to heaven. Um, but, but, but here's the reality of that. Um, this passage that I just read that Paul wrote makes it clear that what you believe matters. In fact, it, it has life and death consequences, um, who and what you put your faith in. So I want to draw a clear line this morning. And, and I don't want to draw a clear line between the Christian and non-Christian because we've taken those, um, uh, some, in America, we, we mislabel people all the time, right? We say, well, I'm a Christian. Really? Yeah, I drove by a church once, so that makes me a Christian. Or my grandfather was a Baptist preacher, preacher so that makes me a Christian. But rather, the line that I want to, I want to draw this morning is be the, between the Christian who's standing firm in his faith in Jesus the Christian who's walking with God and confident of the salvation that he enjoys or she enjoys. Um, they know that God is pleased with them, um, that they're on their way to heaven. Um, and so, so, so they know um, because of their faith in Jesus Christ that they're going to spend eternity in heaven with God the Father when this life is over. I want to draw a line between those people and the rest of the people on the planet. See, Paul issues a warning right at the beginning of that passage. Unless you believe something that was never true in the first place. So this morning, I want to help you make your faith sure. I want to help you know that you can spend eternity in heaven with Jesus Christ this morning. And the way for us to do that is to start with Jesus. And the morning on Resurrection Sunday, the way we start with Jesus means that we start with an empty tomb because that's where we meet Jesus on Resurrection morning because Jesus isn't dead. He is alive and he is risen. Now, the, the church regularly celebrates um, Resurrection Sunday every year, and it has for 2,000 years because the event that happened um, over 2,000 years ago still has major impact today. When we looked at 1 Corinthians 15, Paul said there were 
three things that were most important that he wanted to share with us. Do you remember what they were? The first one is that Christ died. The second was that he was buried. And the third was that he raised from the dead. Now, historians are very clear about uh, two things about Jesus. And they all um, pretty much across the board agree about two things. One is that he existed. And the second one was that he was crucified. Tacitus, Josephus, the Talmud, which was written by the Pharisees, Talus and Philegion, I think it's pronounced, Tertullian, um, he quotes letters which were written between Tiberius and Pontius Pilate talking about Jesus and his claims to divinity. There's enough proof that Jesus lived and died that we can be sure of him being a real person who walked the earth as, as, as sure as we can be of anyone else who has ever walked the earth in history. Uh, now, I want you to get this. The fact that Jesus lived and died isn't what's earth-shattering. The fact that he was a good teacher doesn't change history. The fact that he was reported to work miracles doesn't make him as unique as you might think. The fact that he hung on a cross and was crucified doesn't make him any different than anyone else who has ever lived. Because the reality is that thousands of people have been crucified throughout history. There's one fact about Jesus that makes him unique. There's one thing that sets him apart from every other person who has ever lived. And that's the fact of the empty tomb. And there are secular historians that admit that there was an empty tomb. And they've tried to come up with a lot of different um, excuses to explain away why the tomb was empty and what happened to Jesus. And some of you have probably heard of these, uh, these excuses and these theories. One of them is the swoon theory. And the idea is that when Jesus was on the cross, he just passed out while he was up there. Then they took him off the cross, they put him in the tomb, and that he, he was revived while he was in the tomb. The problem with that story is in the uh, witness of Jesus being crucified there's also there's talk of a spear that gets shoved into him and when it talks about the liquid coming out of his body the way i understand that is that there's a sack around the heart that was pierced and that would surely kill jesus um one of the ideas is that his followers came and they hid his body but the the deal when you read through the the witness of scripture it says that the pharisees came to pilate to make sure that that very thing would not happen. And they sealed the tomb and they placed guards in front of the tomb to make sure that couldn't happen. Um, so, so, so here's what we know. We know for sure Jesus lived. We know that Jesus was crucified. We know that he died. And we know that the tomb was empty. In fact, a movement started in the months and years after his death that claimed he had been raised from the dead and was worthy of worship. Something dramatic happened that transformed a group of Jewish men who knew there was only one God and that they must worship that one God or go to hell. They became a group of bold preachers who turned the world upside down with a message that said, the man you crucified uh, God raised from the dead, and we are to now worship him. It's not an easy message to believe, is it? And it's not one you would make up. Um, one thing is for sure. If the Jewish or Roman authorities could have led us to the body of Jesus, they would have absolutely done so because it would have put an end to this movement. But they didn't. So what op other options do we have? Um, that the disciples stole the body and knew all along they were lying? That simply doesn't make sense psychologically. Because when people die, uh, lie, excuse me, when people lie, they typically do it to gain some kind of benefit. If these guys lied, the disciples of Jesus, they got killed for it. Not one of them, when they were being persecuted, uh, and killed for their confession of faith in Jesus, not one of them broke ranks and said, oops, we, we were only kidding. And every one of the original 12 disciples were martyred for their faith. That uh, Luke was hung on an olive tree 
by the priest of a pagan religion in Greece. James the Great, one of the sons of thunder, when you love to be called that. Sons of thunder! He's the brother of John. He was beheaded in 44 AD. Philip, he was scourged, thrown into prison, then crucified in 54 AD. Matthew, he was ran through with a sword in 60 AD. James the Less, the brother of Jesus, he was beaten with a club, then stoned, then finished off by having his brains beaten with a fuller's club. Matthias was stoned and then beheaded. Andrew, the brother of Peter, he was crucified. Mark, he was dragged to pieces by a horse under the Alexandrian idol. Peter, he was crucified upside down. Some history reports uh, that his wife was killed as well. Judas, he was crucified in Edessa in 72 AD. Bartholomew, he was beaten and then crucified. Thomas was run through with a spear. Simon was crucified in 74 AD. Barnabas was killed in 73 AD. He was hung. And John was banished to the island of Patmos. So you'll ask, why were all of these disciples killed? Well, the enemies of Christianity, they tell us why they were, uh, why they were killed. Uh, I want to read a couple historical accounts to you. First one's from a, a guy named Tacitus who was a a historian at that time. Here's what he writes. He says, Nero substituted as culprits and punished with the most utmost refinements of cruelty, a class of men loathed for their vices, whom the crowd styled Christians. Christus, the founder of the name, had undergone the death penalty in the reign of Tiberius by sentence of procurator Pontius Pilate and pernicious superstition was checked for a moment. So faith in Jesus stopped for a moment. Only to break out once more, not merely in Judea, the home of the disease, but in the capital itself, where all things horrible or shameful in the world collect and find a vogue. First then, the confessed members of the sect were arrested. Next, on their disclosures, vast numbers were convicted. Not so much on the count of arson, is for hatred of the human race. And derision accompanied their end. They were covered with wild beast skins and torn to death by dogs. Or they were fastened on crosses and when daylight failed were burned to serve as lamps by night. Nero had offered his gardens for the spectacle and gave an exhibition in his circus, mixing with the crowd in the habit of a charioteer or mounted on his car. Hence, in spite of a guilt which had earned the most exemplary punishment, there arose a sentiment of pity due to the impression that they were being sacrificed not for the welfare of the state, but to ferocity of a single man. Pliny the Younger, when talking about Christians that were persecuted, he writes, In the meantime, the method I have observed toward those who have been denounced to me as Christians is this. I interrogated them whether they were in fact Christians. If they confessed it, I repeated the question twice, adding the threat of capital punishment. If they still persevered, I ordered them to be executed. For whatever the nature of their beliefs might be, I could at least feel no doubt that determined contumacy and inflexible obstinacy deserved chastisement. There were others also possessed with the same infatuation, But being citizens of Rome, I directed them to be taken to Rome for trial. These accusations spread, as is usually the case, from the mere fact of the matter being investigated. And several forms of the mischief came to light. A placard was put put up without any signature, accusing a large number of persons by name. Those who denied they were or had ever been Christians and who repeated after me an invocation to the gods, little g-gods, so uh, uh, being willing to uh, worship uh, false idols instead of Jesus, and offered formal worship with libation and frankincense before your statue, which I had ordered to be brought into court for that purpose, together with those of the gods, and who finally cursed Christ, none of which acts, it is said, those who are really Christians can be forced to perform, Uh, these I thought it proper to discharge. We'll make them innocent. If they affirmed, however, that the whole of their guilt or their error was that they were in the habit of meeting on a certain fixed day before it was light, when they sang in alternative verses a hymn to Christ, 
as to a god and bound themselves by a solemn oath not to perform any wicked deed, never to commit any fraud, theft, or adultery, never to falsify their word, or never to deny a tress which they should be called upon to make it good, after which it was their custom to separate and then reassemble to partake of food, but food of an ordinary and innocent kind. Even this practice, however, they had abandoned after the publication of my edict, by which, according to your orders, I had forbidden political associations. I therefore judged it is so much more than necessary to extract the real truth with the assistance of torture from two female slaves who were styled deaconesses. But I could discover nothing more than depraved and excessive superstition. So we're holding them, uh, accusing them of not lying, of singing to Jesus, of not committing adultery, of keeping their word. We're accusing them of all those things. Um, we, we threatened them with death, and the only thing we could find was that they continued in their faith. So here's what the people would say. You can threaten me, but you can't scare me with death. Jesus has already conquered it, right? Paul just wrote um, 500 people uh, witnessed the fact that Jesus rose from the dead, right? He said some of them are dead, but much of them are still alive. Go ask them and see what they say about Jesus. Could it have been a hallucination? No, because hallucinations don't affect that many people at one time. So we have to um, explain this amazing phenomena, not only of all the fact that, that they're all making a common confession, but then what happened in their lives and what happened to this church called the Church of Jesus Christ. No religion ever grew more quickly, and no religion today is as widespread. The one thing the church agrees on, and there's a lot of things that we disagree on. Right? We disagree on our, our form of, of music and, and the way we're supposed to dress. And, and, and for some, even the method of baptism is, is in disagreement by some today. But the one thing we all agree on is that Jesus rose from the dead. Millions of people have claimed to meet, uh, meet Jesus. Paul's very clear. If it didn't happen, every Christian who has ever lived is to be pitied more than anyone. Everyone who is at a funeral believed that their loved one has gone to be uh, with Jesus is deluded if Jesus is still buried somewhere in Israel. The apostles and every believer have falsely testified about God that he raised Jesus from the dead if he hasn't indeed been raised from the dead. And if he's not risen, then every great transforming work of Jesus is somehow a delusion. Every great social reformer like William Wilberforce who claimed to be driven by a call from God or a call from Jesus specifically should be locked up rather than revered as a great historical figure. Without the resurrection, the Christian faith comes tumbling down. Christianity is the meanest hoax if Jesus is still dead. It's cruel and sadistic if Jesus did not raise from the dead. Here we are, think about this, singing to a dead man, praying to a dead man, preaching about a dead man, worshiping a dead man, trusting in a dead man. If Jesus is dead, everything's changed. The resurrection is crucial. If it wasn't for the resurrection, we would still be in our sins. How could Jesus work in us to forgive us and make us like him if he's still dead? But as Paul simply says, in fact, Christ has been raised. Jesus is not dead. He is alive. Every other religious leader is dead. No one has conquered death except for Jesus. The resurrection was Jesus' justification. It was God's stamp of approval that he still loved his son and that the work had been done. Remember, Jesus said, it is finished. The price for sin has been paid. And God himself says, amen, with the resurrection and puts a stamp of approval on what Jesus has done. I love what it says in Romans chapter 4, verse 22. This is why it was credited to him, talking about uh, Abraham, uh, as righteousness, the words that was credited to him were written not for Abraham alone, but also for us. 
to whom God will credit righteousness for us who believe in him who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead. He was delivered over to death for our sins and was raised to life for our justification. Now, justification and righteousness are closely tied together in Scripture. Philippians says it this way. This is Paul writing about everything uh, that he left behind to follow Jesus. And he says this, he says, What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. So here's the thing. When we accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and our Savior, it's not that just that our sins are dealt with and we were just made morally neutral before God. It's not that only, it's not only like, um, I've heard it said, it's like we've never sinned before. But it's also just as if I'd lived a perfect life for eternity and was as pure and righteous as Jesus. See, this is this great exchange. I give Jesus my sin, and Jesus Christ gives me and gives you his perfect righteousness. This is the good news. I love what Spurgeon says. All the love and acceptance, all the love and acceptance which perfect obedience could have obtained of God belong to you because Christ was perfectly obedient on your behalf. The resurrection is the one thing that gives us hope. For as Christ has been raised, as Paul says here, we too shall be raised if we trust in him. The Bible talks clearly about who we are without Jesus. You know, in Ephesians 2.12, it says this, In those days you were living apart from Christ. You were excluded from the citizenship among the people of Israel, and you did not know the covenant promises God had made to them. Look at this. It says, You were in this world without God and without hope, right? Because because we're, we're, born, we're born spiritually dead. As we go through life, false hope simply makes us more desperate because every disappointment is like death to hope. The Bible says that, that hope deferred makes the heart sick. We go through life feeling that something's missing, that there, there must be more to life than this, right? We, we, we're, 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 without Jesus, we're living so far from that life that God intended for us that we're effectively dead already. We're like dead men walking. We spend our lives trying not to talk about death, but we know it's coming. But when we come face to face with the man whom death could not hold, we have a hope. For the Christian, um, there's a hope that comes alive in Christ Jesus. And here's what Peter says in 1 Peter uh, Chapter 1, 3 through 9. And then he starts out by saying, Praise be to God. In now, we got to start this out a little bit because there's an exclamation point on the end. You ready? Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. I think when he's writing this, he's all fired up because he, he's experiencing hope. And his great mercy has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you through, uh, through faith, uh, through, for you who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. In all this, you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief um, in all kinds of trials. These have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Verse 8 says, Though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an expressible and glorious joy. For you are receiving the end result of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Let me ask you a question. Is that true of you this morning? If not, it can be. You can meet Jesus today. You can be born again because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Your spiritual death can be swallowed up. You can receive life from Je Jesus. You can, you, it can happen right now, right? Sin does not win. Jesus does. 
Death does not win. Jesus does. He really did die for our sin. He really did die for uh, rise for our salvation. And we can sing to Him today, and we can confess our sins to Him because He's alive. Right? Jesus said, I am God. I have come to take away sin. I will de- die, and three days later, I will come back to life uh, again to prove it. And you know what? He did it. Solidify your faith this morning. Dwell on the resurrection of Jesus and let him give you a firm foundation. So one of those questions, right, is, 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 is what, what's in it for me? What is the outcome for us of this, this resurrection that I'm preaching about this morning? A couple things. Our sins are dealt with and we are declared righteous. The righteousness of Christ is imputed or given to us. We're born again a new beginning, right? The old is behind us, including our fears and our our sin and our guilt. There's a hope for our future that goes beyond the grave. There's a hope for now, right? Not only do we have this hope that goes into eternity, but I have a hope for tomorrow that, that I can, um, that, that Jesus is transforming my life, that he begins a good work in me, and he's faithful to complete that work in me, that he makes me to, to, to love and, and, and have peace and act and, and see the world more like he does. And maybe the most important thing is I have a relationship with Jesus, and we can know him and love him even though we don't see him with our eyes. And so as I close today, I want you to hear one more time from Jesus himself. And this is in John. There's this this amazing story where he raises Lazarus from the dead. And his sister, um, you know, she, she confesses that he's Lord, but she doesn't really know what it all means. And here's what Jesus says to her in John chapter 11, 25. It says, Jesus says to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. They'll live eternally, even though their bodies will die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. And then he asks the final question. Do you believe this? How about you? Do you believe this? I, I guess the question for many this morning is, how do we become a Christian? How do we receive all the benefits that I just told you about. It's a matter of faith. It's a matter of becoming united with Christ. It's a matter of putting your trust in him. Um, And and we do it a couple of different ways. Uh, We, with as much faith as we're given by God, we ask Jesus to forgive us of our sins. We believe um, that his blood shed on the cross you probably can't see it. I'm looking over here because the cross is sitting over here. We, we believe that his blood shed on the cross uh, is holy blood, and that blood washes away our sins. We believe that Jesus lied in, in, in a tomb dead for three days, and on the third day, by the power of the Holy Spirit, he rose from the dead. He was seen by over 500 people. We believe that today Jesus ascended back to heaven and is at the right hand of the Father and he invites us to trust him for our eternal salvation. He invites us to enter into a relationship with him. So we put our trust with him. It's a very personal relationship with Jesus. The other thing that we do publicly is we confess our faith by being baptized, right? Scripture tells us in Romans 10, if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And baptism is the way we publicly confess what has happened. And it's this beautiful picture of being united with Christ, right? We, we go down in the water and we're united with the death of Christ and we come out of the water and united with the resurrection of Christ, And then we spend the rest of our life discovering what it means to follow Jesus and walk with Jesus and be a part of his mission to to, to rescue and save a lost world. The death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, it really is good news. It really is a good story. My question for you today is, do you believe it? Do you believe it? It's going to bring us to communion this morning. 
And if you're a follower of Jesus, we look at you as family and we invite you to partake of the family meal. This bread and this juice that I have in front of me represent the body and blood of Jesus that was given on the cross for the forgiveness of our sins. And as we take communion every week here as a faith family at Real Life, we prepare our hearts to take it by praying through a few items that I'd like to invite you to pray through the day. The first thing that we do is we confess our sins to Jesus. And maybe this morning, for the first time, you can come to Jesus, ask him to forgive you of your sins, ask him to be your Lord and Savior, and commit to following him. So you can do that in the quietness of your heart this morning. As a follower of Jesus, maybe you find yourself in a place that um, you realize that I have fallen short of, of God's perfect standard for me. And I mean, Christians aren't perfect. We're forgiven, right? And so we come to Jesus in the quietness of our heart and ask him to forgive us of our sins. Every week as we prepare to take communion, we pray for those uh, that don't know Jesus Christ as a Lord and Savior. Uh, uh, Jesus calls them those that are lost. They're like sheep without a shepherd. We pray that God will soften their hearts to hear the message of the gospel. We pray for opportunities as a church to share the truth of the gospel and God's love with them. And so I just invite you, and, and I love to use my sanctified imagination to picture that face every week of the people I'm praying for. We pray for the hurting every week. And man, there is so many hurting people in our community, in our world right now. We pray for the hurting. We pray for God's comfort for those that are hurting uh, spiritually and, and maybe those that are grieving. We pray for God's provision for those that are hurting because of lack. We pray that God will give us opportunities to minister to those that are hurting. And we pray for the church. We pray for this church, Real Life Ministry Silver Valley, that we will be committed to the mission Jesus has called us to, that we will be people of compassion, and people of love and mercy, that we will reach beyond our walls and we will share the good news of the gospel and the love of Christ with the world who is desperate for him, that we will not be slowed down by a virus or by fear or by any of those things, but we will courageously uh, minister to this community that God has put us in because we want people to know Jesus more than anything. I invite you to take a moment tonight and ask Jesus um, if there's anything this morning that you, you need to just confess to him, anything that is on your heart that you need to pray for. I just invite you to do that this morning. And then I'm going to read from 1 Corinthians 11. Paul writes this in uh, chapter 11, verse 23. He said, I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's take the bread, remembering the body of Jesus, given for the forgiveness of sin. And then it says, In the same way after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Let's take the cup together. And then he says, For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Every time we take the communion elements together as a faith family, we are proclaiming the Lord's death, but we're also proclaiming the resurrection that Jesus is alive, and one day he's coming back to make everything right. Please join me as we pray. Lord Jesus, thank you. Thank you, Jesus, for being faithful your time here on earth, for living a sinless, perfect life, for going to the cross uh, willingly to be the sacrifice for sin, for your display of power as you rose from the dead on the third day, for your ascension to heaven, and the fact that today you pray for us, you call us out of darkness, you give us your righteousness, and you're preparing a place for us to spend eternity with you in heaven. Jesus, we love you. And we love you because you first loved us, you love us, and you love us perfectly. We pray all of this with great thanks. In your holy name, Jesus, amen. We would love it if you would uh, uh, continue your worship this resurrection morning with us as we sing one final song.
Thanks. so glad that you decided to spend Resurrection Sunday with us. Uh, look, uh, do me a favor, look this week on our Facebook page. You'll see uh, we're going to try to put more posts on there to encourage you with the Word of God this week. And uh, again, I just want to encourage you to say yes to Jesus. If you, uh, if you don't know, if you can trust Him yet, man, there are so many good books out there that will help you work through some of those questions of faith. Uh, give us a call at the church office. Uh, send us a private message on uh, our Facebook page, and I'd love to, to tell you what those titles are. So uh, so God bless you. We love you. Let me pray for us real quick, and then, um, and then I hope you have a, a great uh, Resurrection Sunday morning. So let's pray. Father God, thanks so much for being good to us. Thank you for sending Jesus. Thank you for calling us out of darkness into light. And thank you for being our God. You are faithful. You are good. And your heart toward us is good. We are grateful. We pray all of this in your holy name, Jesus. Amen. Goodbye, church. Love you. See you soon. God bless.